Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. I always like to call and response. You guys should know that by now. It's really awesome to be here. Mostly friendly faces. I think most everybody's smiling, right? <laughs> and it's not really patting myself on the back to say thank you to the choir for the special music. It was awesome. It's certainly great to be sitting in the middle of all those good voices and have Mike Croker in there, too, and be able to, to be a part of that. But uh, it's just another way to glorify God on his holy days um, and... Again, this is, I hope all of you just feel how special it is to have a chance like this to get together. It's kind of a warm-up for the Feast of Tabernacles. It isn't too far away now. There's a song, there are a few songs, but I'm going to focus a little bit on one to start, that has been part of our hymnal since I can remember, um, which goes back into the 60s. Um, it's the song that we're going to talk about a little bit as we start here is the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Uh, and I think it's been in every, every iteration of the hymnal. I didn't go back and check on all of them, but I, I remember singing it <laughs> for most of the time there. And it has uh, kind of an interesting history written by Julia Ward for her husband. Uh, it started out as a poem. It was first published in the Atlantic Monthly in 1862. Her husband was a little bit older than her, which really wasn't common back in the, or uncommon back in those days, and he devoted his life to helping others. That included starting a school to educate uh, some who were blind and deaf. And after their marriage, she continued on, or continued or joined in with his work, and they became pretty influential in that area of education. As he grew older, he, um, his eyesight started to fail, which, of course, was interesting since that was who the pe kind of people that he had worked with for most of his life now. And eventually he became almost totally blind. There's a phrase in the hymnal that I think takes on new meaning when you understand the story behind those, the words. He had dedicated his life to helping others. He'd seen a great deal of suffering, and now his sight was leaving him, and he was near the end of his life. Probably asked all those normal questions that I think many of us tend to do as we get older. Did my life have any value? Have I lived a life that pleased God? What good am I now that I'm getting older and decrepit? And blindness was, I'm sure, very difficult for him. So Julia, when she wrote her poem, wanted to encourage her husband uh, to remember that while he had done great things in his physical life, there was more than just that physical life to look forward to or to remember. And so that's part of the reason why she added the line, my eyes have seen the glory of, <coughs> excuse me, of the coming of the Lord. She wanted him to recognize that there was something in the future to look forward to, that coming and the glory that would accompany it. And that's where this story merges with part of the story, part of the picture of this day that we're going to talk about in this message. Trumpets had a lot of different uses as you look through the Bible. I think Connie and I were... were somewhere between seven and nine, <laughs> different ways that trumpets were used. And a couple of those were they were used to give direction and they were used to call attention, to get the attention of whoever was there, whether it was Israel moving or when there, when there were different temple services. And I would like to ask you how much your attention has been on the meaning of this day as we led up to it and today as we sat here in services. And how clear is your vision of the return of Christ? How clear is that? Do you th have you thought about what that actually is going to look like? What it will be like? One of the reasons we're here today, one of the things this day pictures is glory. Christ's glory. At his return and... The, the, the fact that this day pictures us joining in on that glory as well. 
this day pictures a change for the world and for all of the firstborn. A, a, a change that brings glory. So that will be the focus of this message. Looking at some scriptures that talk about that glory. Because I want us to get that picture. I want us to have that vision. I don't want this to just be a holy day that, we, that kind of comes and goes. And it's so easy because we're looking forward to the Feast of Tabernacles. We're looking forward to trying to, to, to getting away. And, but this has impact. This has meaning. Probably one of the most meaningful events in the lives of the firstborn. Turn to Romans chapter 8. We'll begin reading in verse 16, Romans chapter 8. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if we're children, then we're heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared with the glory which will be revealed in us. Glory to be revealed in us. Christ isn't selfish. He doesn't want to hog all the focus. He doesn't want to hog all the glory this day represents to himself. He's going to share that glory with all of us. And it will be glorious. The, the word that's translated glory there means to exalt in the company of many. It's not something that happens and, and is hidden. This glory of this day is something that the entire world will recognize and will see. And it won't be, again, just Christ's glory, and it is going to be awesome, his return, and the way that he returns. But they'll also see those firstborn joining in that glory. Skip on down to verse 28. For we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, for those he foreknew and he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Again, just another scripture pointing out that we're in this together with Christ. We're sharing in this. We will be in his image. We will look like him. In verse 30, Moreover, those that he predestined, those he also called. And those that he called, he also justified. And those that he justified, he also glorified. We will be glorified just like Christ. We will have the same kind of glory. I want you to think about what that is going to be. What, what, do you, what picture do you have? Christ is coming with trumpets, with thunder, with lightning, with power in a way that the entire world will see. And then we know, we'll probably read later on, that those of the firstborn join him. And I believe that that means that will be visible as well. That the people will see that resurrection, recognize something special is, is happening. And that we will be there in that glory and join in that glory. We're going to look at Again, some of the scriptures that talk about what that glorified state is like. Some of the attributes, the characteristics of, of that, glory, that glory. Some of them kind of talk about it from our perspective, and certainly some scriptures talk about it from Christ's perspective. But we're going to begin, at least today, looking at what it means. We're, we're told that we will have a glorified body. That our body will become different. Physically, we will be different. And so let's we're going to look at a few scriptures that talk about that. And I, again, I want you to think about this. This is your future. This is what you have to look forward to and what this day pictures. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Actually, one of the special music songs that we sang today was kind of the impetus for the 
title or for the, the focus of this message because we sing in there glory to God in the highest and, and it focuses on the glory of God, glorifying God. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 will begin in verse 41. There is one glory of the sun, there's another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. For, every, for one star differs from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the body, of the dead. The body is sown in corruption and it's raised in incorruption. So part of this glorification that will happen to us is a change to something that's incorruptible. And we usually, we usually focus, when we talk about incorruption, we focus on physical. Physical dies, the physical decays, the physical becomes, becomes corrupt. And that's certainly part of what this is pointing to. But there's even a more important incorruption that we, be, that we become. We become incapable of sin as part of the process of being glorified. We become like Christ and like the Father. When, we, when we're changed, when we're glorified, we don't le need we won't have that temptation for sin. We won't sin anymore. We become incorruptible both in body and in spirit. And I think those of all of us, we fight that corruption of our spirit every day. And too many times we fail to resist that corruption and to think that after the events of this day we will be incorruptible in spirit. Is, is glorious, something to look forward to, something to think about and, and praise God about. But I don't want to m minimize too much how important it is that our body will be incorruptible as well. When I was young, I really didn't think about that, that much. You know I, I, you know, I could run and jump and do anything physically I wanted to almost, and it was easy. And as I get older, I see that it's not the same anymore. I have aches and pains. I'm wearing a knee brace because my knee hurts all the time. I, uh, I don't sleep the way that I used to. And, and so as I've gotten older, gotten maybe wiser, thought about it better, I, I understand how awesome and glorious it will be to have an incorruptible body as well. A body that doesn't wear out. A body that's eternal never getting tired, never feeling pain, always perfectly functioning. So part of the glory that we will receive, that we will share with Christ, is that incorruption. Let's read verse 43. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. Our glory will be one of power as well, just as Christ returns in power, manifesting, showing his power and his abilities, we will share in that power. Hopefully we'll be a little bit smarter than the thun sons of thunder who wanted to uh, wipe out people who were giving Jesus a hard time. I think we'll have a little more wisdom, uh, coupled with God's spirit, than that. But we will have power. The Bible tells us that even the strongest person is weak compared to what will happen once we're glorified. That we have no real comprehension of what the power of God and the power of, that we will have through his spirit will be like. But again, think about how you would righteously use that power. What, how do you want to use that power? That God is going to, that you're going to have as part of your inheritance, as part of your being, as part of this glory. What would you like to do? How would you like to use it in a way that benefits the rest of mankind and glorifies God? We will have power, we will be glorified with power. Continue now in verse 44. It is sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. And there is a natural body. There is also a spiritual body. And it's written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. 
And the last Adam, Christ, became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural. And afterward, the spirit follows. The first man was of the earth made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so are those who are heavenly. As we have borne the image of the man of dust, we will also bear the image of the heavenly man. Right now, we are still essentially the children of Adam. God's spirit gives us a down payment and a promise to become his children, but we're formed like Adam. We're made from the same material as Adam was. Once we're glorified, once we're truly children of God, that changes. That physical body changes to one that's composed of spirit in the likeness of Christ. And our existence, our existence is no longer linked to the earth. From really the moment of conception, not just the moment of birth, but the moment of conception, our existence is tied to this earth. We need the earth for nutrients. We need the earth for air. We need the earth for light. We need the earth for all of the things that this physical body needs to survive. At that moment, when we are glorified, our existence, the source of our existence, the necessity for our existence, changes from this earth to God the Father and his throne. That, is the, that becomes, that is the source of our existence and the focus of our existence. We be, go from being a part of an earthly realm to being a part of a heavenly realm. And I think most of us have speculated, you know, what's that going to be like? But we know that we can't really come close to imagining what that is going to be like, how glorious that's going to be to live in that realm rather than this one. But that is part of what happens when we are changed. When the events of this day occurs, we change our, our address, our residence, to a completely different level of existence. Let's look now, let's go through some scriptures that talk about what Christ was able to do in his glorified body. Again, help us to understand some of the characteristics of that glory, how that will, what will be open to us, what will be available to us. Turn to Luke chapter 24. We'll read a, f a fairly decent section of the scriptures here in Luke 24. We're going to begin in verse 13. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they talked together of all the things that had happened. And it was while they conversed in reasons that Jesus himself drew near to them and he walked with them, but their eyes were restrained so that they didn't know him. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you're having with one another? Why are you walking so sad? So we, we find that Christ, as a spirit being, had the ability to conceal himself. The Bible isn't clear, you know, did he look differently? Or did he just block their recognition? They saw him, so they saw something with their eyes. They recognized it was a person. But he, he was able to remain anonymous. Maybe that's the best way to describe it. And we'll, we'll talk about what that means a little as we go on here. But let's continue reading. Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, Are, are you a stranger in Jerusalem that you have, don't know the things that have happened? over these last days? And Christ said, well, what do you mean? And they said to him, well, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, 
how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was, he was the one who was supposed to redeem Israel. And besides all of this, today's the third day since all of this happened and some women went to the grave. And when they got there, early in the day, they were astonished because they could not find his body. And they came saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found, well, what do you know? The women knew what they were talking about. They weren't just exaggerating. It was exactly as they had said, but they didn't see Christ either. And then Christ said, you foolish ones, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and entered into his glory? And then beginning at Moses and all of the prophets, he expounded to them all of the scriptures concerning himself. Christ used this ability to shield himself, shield their recognition, because it was the most effective way for him to teach them at the moment. If he had, if he had appeared as Christ and recognizable, that would have been the focus. But they were, they were lacking in understanding. They still didn't get it. You know, after spending, being around Christ for many, many years, hearing what he had said, they didn't really get it. And so Christ used that anonymity, I think I said that right, to teach them, remind them, show them what the Christ was supposed to be like. And it speaks to our ability in a glorified state to find the right way to teach people. And I can see that there are times where it would be very useful to not have someone who may have known you know that it was you when we work with them as spirit beings. If it was a negative relationship or for whatever reason, it might be better that they don't recognize you. And then, of course, there are times where, I, again, I can see where that wouldn't be useful. But part of this glory, part of the ability of this glorification is the ability the, the ability to, to blind eyes, and that, I, th I think that's not as important as what Christ did with it. He used it to effectively teach. And part of our glorification will be we will be able to more effectively teach people. And I hope that all of you, some part of your heart burns for that ability. We've all probably tried to reach someone that wasn't part of the church. And get them to understand, to share what we know is such an awesome truth and run up against, you know, blank stairs, blind, bl blank walls, buttered our heads, whatever you want to call it, and how much you wanted to, for them to see what you see. And I feel that it's an incredible aspect of this glorification that we'll receive that we will be able to know how to reach people, to know how to reach each individual and to teach them and to share this in a way that they recognize and to see that light go off in their eyes and see them begin to recognize. Let's just read a couple more scriptures here, verse 31. It says, their eyes were open, Christ allowed them to see who he really was, and then he vanished. And then in verse 36, now, again, the group was sitting there talking, and Christ says, now, as they had said these things, Christ himself stood in the midst of them and said, peace to you. Again, it points to the ability to come and go in a completely different way. Our body is not going to be physical. We don't have to walk through doors. We don't have to walk, you know, to walk distances. We don't have to travel. We don't have to hobble along. We can appear when we're needed. And also, again, as Christ uses it, effectively, we can just disappear. We can just move, move off. Part of this glory is, again, understanding all of the abilities of, of a spiritual body. 
And through a glass darkly, I think we understand, we'll, we understand right now all of the abilities of that spiritual body. To use it in a way that serves others and helps others and reaches others. Verse 32 says, has, a, a, I think, a very interesting point that's made about this aspect of being able to teach and effectively reach someone. Verse 32, one of the, the disciples said, once they had recognized the end, this is after they had, Christ had revealed himself to them, and they said, didn't our heart burn within us while we were, he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? He made them able to really feel the truth of God's word and God's plan in a, in a deep way and gave them an understanding that they hadn't had before. It says he opened the scriptures to them. This ability to teach others is an incredible gift. Right up there alongside all of the other aspects of the glorification that we've talked about. Because it points to our ability to serve. Because Christ comes on this day to serve mankind. And to serve the firstborn. And he, we are changed so that we can serve in a better way. So that our, we have abilities that allow us to work and be intimately involved in God's plan. We were talking, I was talking before the service with someone, and we, we, we kind of said, this is when we become part of the solution instead of part of the problem. We become part of how God solves Satan's hold over mankind, how God solves the problem of a, of, of a group of children that have departed from him that don't understand him. We become part of the solution. Let's turn uh, to another scripture in Psalm 16. We're going to begin in verse 8. Of course, this is another one of the writings of David. Usually great wisdom in the things that David tells us about a relationship with God. He said, I've set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand and I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in the grave, nor will you allow your Holy One, Christ, to see corruption. You will show me the path of life, in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Part of David's talking about what he's looking forward to, or part of what he's looking forward to, when he is with the Lord. And he says it's going to be a time of complete joy and everlasting pleasure. One of the things that comes with this glory is everlasting joy and pleasure. We will experience things the way that God and the Father does. The Bible talks about the children of God, and we, met, we talked about it in the, in the hymn service, the children of God singing in his presence. So filled with joy, so filled with wonder, so filled with awe, so filled with glory, that they have to express those feelings in, in song. And yes, I think all of our voices will be better as spirit beings than they are right now. I think there truly will be a heavenly choir that would be worth listening to. <laughs> 
But it talks about the response to glory is that, that pleasure, that joy, a level of joy that we haven't experienced before. It, this time that we're talking about has so many different levels where God's glory is manifested in different ways. In us, and as we share it with Christ. Turn now to Philippians chapter 3. Let's begin reading in verse 20. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. For our citizenship is or will be in heaven, for which we also eagerly await the Savior, or from which we also eagerly await the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the work by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Glory. I hope that you've been thinking about it a little bit as we've gone through this message. I hope that you've been thinking about what it means for Christ to return in glory, that you've tried to build a picture of what that is going to be like, how that's going to be fulfilled. I hope that you've also thought on how we will all join in that glory and share that glory and what that means. And I hope it lifts your heart and encourages you and gives you something to think about and focus on and share. This feast pictures many different events that lead to Christ's return and pictures Christ's return. For those who are called, it pictures a time of transformation, a time of moving from inglorious to glorious, and corrupt, from being corruptible to being incorruptible. And that has, that it's, those are, that's life changing. This day is life changing. We've looked at a number of scriptures that have talked about that. Not all of them. Not all of them. And you certainly could spend time and, and should spend time thinking about this, meditating on this, thanking God for this. Hopefully, through this, you're able to see, as Julia Ward wrote, at least see it a little bit more clearly, the glory of the coming of the Lord. And, in addition, see the coming glory that waits for those who meet Christ in the air at the seventh trumpet. <laughs>